Well, hello and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. A while ago, I put out this video on Owen Benjamin, who was asking us to help save him from the flat earth. I went ahead and answered a lot of his questions, but I've gotten over 2,000 comments, many of which are coming from flat earthers, that are rather critical of my presentation. So I'm going to go through the comments and have a look and see if I can answer a few more of their questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, and talk more flat earth. This is the thing I want to ask the round earth people to explain to me. If the earth is spinning at 700 miles an hour, 1100 miles an hour, or whatever, why isn't the air spinning? And before you answer real fast and say, oh, it's all relative, the higher you go in the air, the less atmosphere there is until there's almost no atmosphere. Now, originally, when I did this video, I put up this slide explaining that the atmosphere is not a closed system. I have air pressure in my backyard, and then there's no container in sight. However, looking at the comments, I see this is still rather unclear. Let's have a look at a few of the questions that came up. Okay, so the first comment has to do with the force of gravity at 40,000 feet. I think that that's a rather good question, because it would seem, since gravity is inversely proportionate to the square of the radius, there would be a significant difference between ground level gravity and gravity, say, 10 miles up in the air. However, there's no follow through on this. The formula for gravity is well known, and it has to do with the radius of the distance between the masses squared. What a lot of people fail to consider is the fact that when you're on the surface of the Earth, you're already 4,000 miles from the center of the Earth's mass. Going up to 4,010 miles from the center of the Earth's mass makes a difference of less than 0.5 percent on the amount of gravity an object would feel. Now another good point that this poster makes is the fact that there is less air at say 10 miles above the surface than there is on the ground. So therefore there would be fewer air molecules for gravity to act on. Well, the question here becomes is how much of an object's mass does gravity act upon? Well, the answer is all of it. It doesn't matter if it's a heavy object or a light object. Gravity acts on all mass the same way. Now, if you recall the basic equation for force, it's mass times acceleration. The fact that there are simply fewer air molecules in the upper atmosphere doesn't really change the fact that they are acted upon by gravity in the same way. So the bottom line is, if you look at the effect of gravity on the atmosphere at different levels, how much uh, of that atmosphere does gravity affect? The answer is all of it. And since it does affect all of it, it affects it all equally, in proportion. If I were to drop a bowling ball on a marble from 10 feet, the bowling ball obviously would hit harder and with more force, but they would both hit at the same time because they were both equally having the same acceleration due to gravity. Now here's a series of three comments that I really like because this is another common misunderstanding that flat earthers have about the atmosphere. They seem to believe that the atmosphere moves independently of the surface of the earth. It does not. That is because everything that comes into being on the surface of the earth is already moving with it. Newton's first law of motion states that objects in motion will continue to remain in motion unless a force acts upon them. There is no force causing the atmosphere to quote unquote stand still while the earth rotates below it. I think the problem that we are seeing in these comments is that many people in the flat earth community don't understand the first two comments or fail to look at the atmosphere and the earth as a single unit. And they fall into the trap of the third comment, even though that third comment was made as sarcasm. Now just to finish this off, there are two times that the atmosphere is affected by the rotation of the earth. One is prevailing winds, such as the trade winds, the westerlies, etc. The other is the Coriolis effect, which has to do with the rotation of storms in the northern and southern hemispheres. As pointed out in this post, flight times going east and west are affected by the rotation indirectly, but that is only because 
there are prevailing winds in the atmosphere. In the North America, for example, it's the westerlies. That results in flight time from New York to Los Angeles being a little bit longer than flight time from Los Angeles back to New York. But that has to do simply with headwinds and tailwinds. Now the final point to drive this home is if you were in a hot air balloon in New York State and you rose up high enough to clear the Rocky Mountains and just let the Earth's rotation bring Los Angeles underneath you, you would exceed the speed of sound and commercial airliners because you'd be in Los Angeles in three hours. I think most people would realize that this is absurd and does not occur, yet we can prove that we are rotating. If you would like to see examples of six different ways that we have determined that we are rotating on the Earth, you can see my Show Me the Rotation video. I'll put a link to it in the description. Here's another one. Why do flights not go around the poles? You know, and that's a great question, and a lot of people ask it. The reason is, is that the shortest distance between any two points on Earth is what's called a great circle route. And this only works on a globe. And since it is the actual shortest distance between any two points on Earth, that means that the Earth is a globe. Now, as far as going over the North Pole, we do that all the time, generally between North America, Russia, and, and Europe, for example. However, there are not many great circle routes that take us anywhere we want over the South Pole. Now, I'm sure the military has some business that takes them down there once in a while, but civilian airliners are in the business to make money. And if the shortest route does not go over the South Pole, they're not going to make a detour just to do it. Now, one exception to that was Pan Am Flight number 50. This was on the 50th anniversary of the founding of Pan Am in 1977, and they had a chartered 747 that circumnavigated the world going over the North and the South Pole. Now, you Although I thought that was pretty clear in the original video, people still ask questions about it. Now, here's one. I found this one comment rather interesting. Now, on a flat Earth, you have a North Pole. On a spherical Earth, you have a North and a South Pole. Yet, he seems to think that my mentioning the fact that we have a South Pole and there are people there is irrelevant. Then he goes on to say that shipping and flight routes support the idea of a flat Earth. Well, that would be fine and dandy if we actually had a model of what the flat earth looked like and could compare the actual mileage to that model. However, we don't. We do have a globe model, and the mileage matches the globe model perfectly, which is why the shortest distance between any two points on earth is a great circle course. And the great circle course is the sole means of navigation long distance across the earth. We've seen numerous YouTube videos about flights from Taiwan to Los Angeles being diverted to Alaska and, and how this doesn't seem to make any sense. It makes perfect sense on a globe Earth because the great circle course between Taiwan and Los Angeles carries it much closer to Alaska than it does to Hawaii. These courses are not plotted to try and maintain some myth of a globe Earth on behalf of NASA. They're plotted this way because these are the actual shortest routes, because the Earth, in reality, is a sphere. This whole idea of gas pressure next to a vacuum seems to confuse many in the flat Earth. Here's an example. The first problem is, is that air pressure pushes into vacuums. Vacuums do not pull on air pressure. Another distinction that is lost is the difference between air pressure and a pressurized system. The air in my tires is pressurized at 40 pounds per square inch. However, the air surrounding that tire in my driveway has a pressure of 14.6 pounds per square inch. That is the distinction between a pressurized system and one with pressure. And while the air pressure is 14.6 pounds per square inch in my driveway, if I go up 10,000 feet, that will drop considerably. Our atmosphere has a pressure gradient from ground level to the edge of space, 62 miles or 100 kilometers above our heads. The pressure gradient continues to drop with elevation until it becomes indistinguishable to the essentially zero pressure of space. There are, of course, a number of reasons for this, gravity being the largest. 
To demonstrate this very clearly, look at a 10 foot deep swimming pool. The pressure at the surface of that pool is one atmosphere. The pressure at the bottom of the pool is two atmosphere. Why is the two atmosphere pressure water at the bottom of the pool not shooting out the top? The short answer is that gravity sets up that pressure gradient in the pool just as it sets up a pressure gradient in the atmosphere. The higher pressure gas or water at the surface or the bottom of the ocean doesn't squirt towards the lower pressure gas or water because of this gravity. Now another thing that seems to confuse people is the curvature of the earth and evidence for the curvature. Well here's a classic example. Owen wanted evidence of curvature. Well here it is. This is the Chicago skyline. As you can see in the top shot, which is across 60 miles of Lake Michigan, we're missing the entire bottom half of the city. This is not due to compression or lensing or any other silly flat earth nonsense. This is due strictly and solely to the curvature of the earth. This is how we see our horizon on earth. If our position is at the top of the pin on the left, we look down to the horizon on the right. Using a water level, we can clearly see this drop to the horizon from our observation point. Now another key point to remember is that our horizon extends in all directions around our observation point. This is specifically why it looks flat to us. It is the same distance from us in any direction and at the same angle. Now, if our position was at that center pin, if we look up to the pin at 12 o'clock, we can see the distance to our horizon. It is at a set distance and viewing angle from our point of view. Now, if we look at the pins at 10 and 2 o'clock from our point of view, we can see that they are not only the same distance, they are the same viewing angle. As a result, if we were to look at the three pins from 10 to 2 o'clock, they would all appear at the same angle the same distance, and between the three of them, they would appear flat. Knowing that and seeing the example, you can see the point of confusion for this next poster. Our horizon is visible if we look directly towards it. If we look to the left or the right, we are again looking directly towards a horizon that is the same distance and angle as the one that we originally saw. The three of them will appear flat. In closing out this section, I think it's useful to put up this photo one more time. Again, notice if you look left to right, the horizon curls in on you. Hopefully that makes a little more sense to people when you can actually see it right in front of you. Now many of the adverse posts that I got on this video fall into this category, raging paranoia and blatant misunderstanding or lack of comprehension of physical properties. Let's see if we can unpack this one point at a time. The first point that he makes is how does trillions of gallons of water stick to a spinning ball while a butterfly flies out easily? Well, that's pretty simple to answer. Both have mass. Obviously, the oceans weigh a lot more than a butterfly. And unlike the oceans, the butterfly is putting energy into flight by flapping its wings. If it stops flapping its wings, guess where it's going to end up? On the ground. Now I've got a pretty good video listed in the uh, description of this one where I talk about the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotations on the waters of the oceans at the equator. Now the amount of force pulling the water off the planet is about 0.3 percent of the force of gravity holding it on. In order for the spin of the Earth to even balance gravity as far as centrifugal force goes, our day could be no longer than 84 minutes long. But on the other hand, if the Earth did rotate every 83 minutes, stuff would start flying off the equator. Fortunately, we rotate once every 24 hours. Well, his next point is spirit levels. Spirit levels measure the line perpendicular to the plumb line to the center of the Earth. That's what level is. It's not flat. As you go around the surface of a sphere, level will change to be perpendicular to the radius. This is why everything from the surface of large lakes and oceans to altitude levels in aircraft are level, but they do follow the curve of the Earth. Aviation gyroscopes are part of navigation instruments that are designed to tell us where we are. They are not specifically designed 
to demonstrate the rotation of the Earth. In fact, the rotation of the Earth introduces error into our position. And as a result, there are design features such as pendulous veins that are designed to counteract this rotation. However, as Bob from Globebusters found out, laser gyros do demonstrate 15 degrees per hour rotation. Now, his last two points are actually pretty simple. First of all, the higher we are, the farther we can see. If I'm standing six feet high on the shore, I can see three miles out. If I'm 33,000 feet in an aircraft, I can see 215 miles. This is perfectly normal on a globe. And as far as CGI, yes, we have CGI. We didn't have it in the 40s when we started seeing the curve of the Earth from rockets. We didn't have it in the 30s when we started seeing the curve of the Earth from airplanes. And some photos from space are CGI or have Photoshop on them. But not all of them. Many of them are film camera images, especially from the early Apollo missions. So if you want to claim that photos from space are CGI, that's fine. Prove each individual photo is CGI. Because if you cannot demonstrate CGI on even one photograph showing the curvature of the Earth, the entire fantasy world of flat Earth is gone. Good luck with that, man. Well, I believe this video is getting long enough. I've handled most of the major themes of the comments. There are a couple of good questions like this one concerning gravity. I've got a video coming out on the Cavendish experiment this week. And I think that if you want to learn a little bit more about gravity, go see an actual dedicated video that I made on it. So let's go ahead and bring this to a close. Uh, once again, thank you for watching, and make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate your support. We are over 4,300 subscribers now, and we're shooting for five. Well, we'll see you again soon. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Take care. This rabbit hole is too deep for me. Fill my brain, get in real soul.